You're at 109 right now. Mic check. Mic microphone check. That's your mic right there. All right, so we're back at another uh, episode. This is uh, Big Mike and I, Big Mike and Larry, catching up. So, this is just uh, just for starters right now. Testing mic, mic test, one, two, one, two. So, what did you want to talk about? So, you need to pull the microphone stand closer to you to adjust it. good yeah I'm good man um what can we talk about here what's been up nothing much what's up with you <laughs> how's school going <laughs> you still not teaching I know, man. That's that's such a that's, that's heartbreaking. I'm like, oh man, what am I doing? Still not teaching with these students. Um, the last we're on vacation now, and so um, this last week, well, vacation started yesterday. So this last week, I I took three days off. I was like, I'm not coming in. I want to get this vacation started earlier. Did they get you? Did you get paid? No. You don't have sick days. I've already used them. You only been in class since August, and you didn't use all your sick time. Um, did I use it? Yeah, yeah. You lazy as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, it's 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 been an interesting, um, an interesting few months, interesting time. But this is cool to have. So we had a vacation for uh, Thanksgiving. And then that was one week, and then we came back for two weeks, and now we have a three-week vacation. And I'm like, adjusting to the one-week, you know, Thanksgiving vacation was was difficult. Coming back after that week was like, we're do, we're back at we're doing this again just for two weeks, and then you don't do shit. Yeah. You a substitute. You don't even teach. Well, it feels it feels like a waste of time. Face uh, feels like a waste of my time at least. Well, but I do I do have my moments. I do have my moments when I do share, you know, where where students are like, hey, they call me Mr. Uh, Sanchez in the um, what is that called in the uh, in the Spanish classroom? For what? I'm Mr. Sanchez, because you gotta immerse yourself in the. If you can't immerse yourself in the culture, you've gotta bring yourself closer to it somehow and just you know feel the vibe. So you gotta pretend to be a Mexican to teach Spanish? I don't think so. <laughs> My my Spanish teacher is when I was at <laughs> prep school was a uh, an old Italian football coach named Mr. Restifo and Mrs. Barrett and this uh, young lesbian and none of them pretended to be Hispanic. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just an academic subject you can get through. Well. Mr. Sands here. Yeah. You could at least been an Afro Cuban. No, no, no. My middle name is, is Alfred, so I tell them call me Alfredo. And my and I choose the my last name, Sanchez. Alfredo Sanchez. El Don Alfredo Sanchez. I Sanchez. call him I tell him uh call me Tukey Williams. Oh my goodness. But speaking, you know, in the same vein as you know, bringing yourself closer to the uh, to the language, it's the Afro Afro Spanish you know culture that the black students should be aware of. Afro Cubans, Afro Peruvians, Afro Mexicanos, Afro. I want to push back on that. I don't give a fuck. 
I'm a foundational black American. <laughs> I don't need to know about none of those. other. Because here's the thing. This is how these fucking diasporans act. I'm watching this bitch on, uh, on YouTube. Now, she, her name is... Uh, you talking about Yvette? No, no, no. It's this swirler who did... Uh, I'll look up her name in a minute. But um, let me tell you this swirler's fucking story. Now, this bitch, uh, she was a given away by her Haitian fucking mother slut uh, to this white woman. This white woman raised her. Fine. She is immersed in white culture. So she joins a rock band. Uh, a drummer from another band sluts her out. Uh, white boy. He has her baby. Or she has his baby. He tells her up front, I will never have anything to do with you or that fucking baby. And he stood on that to this day. Now, mind you, Haitian, born uh, in white culture, had a white man's baby. She got all the smoke for black men. Oh, okay. So how does that work? And then if you uh, ask her, she's like, don't call me black because... Uh, culture is something that you're raised in. Mm. You have to be given black culture. I was never given black culture. So fine. You're not African American. Mm -hmm. You're not, uh, you don't, you, you get slutted out by white men. You got a white man's child. Why you got all this heat for us? We ain't did shit. We literally have never done shit to you. Wow. What's her name? Her name is uh, some dirty whore. I'm going to give you the name in a second. You touched on the foundational black American and, you know, uh, American descendants of uh, slaves, ADOS. And that's a that's a key point right there. You have to because that's for us to stand on because that's who we that's who we are. That's that's what defines us. Um, so. My thing is, I'm looking more critically at my heroes or at the at the the people who are supposedly are supposed to, you know, speak for me or speak for us. And I'm even looking, you know, even critically at, you know, Malcolm X, certainly Marcus Garvey, um and my favorite artist, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and another uh... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are these there are these things where, where I'm looking at it more critically like, wait a minute. Should I even be supporting these people? Why are these people paraded in front of me like these are the people that I should be supporting? Like, what's going on? Okay, for instance, in the case of Malcolm X, all right, as as much as we love and laud and respect his legacy, um, his mother was from uh, Guyana or maybe Grenada, but she, she was an immigrant to America, and she married uh, his father, um... And Malcolm's father was a, a Georgia Negro. And uh, so Malcolm was a first-generation African-American, period. No, he wasn't. His father was from the soil. He was raised in the soil. None of that Grenadian shit made a fucking difference. It, all he did was inform on how he looked. He was uh, raised as a, a black man. All his experiences were of a black man in America. All right. Well, that, that Grenadian shit was irrelevant. Okay. Like Drake's father, Aubrey, his father is from Memphis. That nigga grew up a, a Toronto Jew. That has nothing. To, the, the Memphis shit don't have nothing to do with him. He claim it now because it's cool. But his father? Yeah, his father's from Memphis. But his father is claiming to be a Jew. No. Oh my no, God. Drake his, is. His mother is a Canadian Jew. His father is a nigga from Memphis. <laughs> okay. 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 So that's he he claims that uh that uh that Memphis shit because of his father's background. Okay. Sometimes. Okay. But he just a uh, confused mulatto. <laughs> and right. just like but with, with Malcolm X and as far as I'm concerned, my love of Malcolm X stops before he goes to Mecca. Everything he says past Mecca, I don't rock with. He was like uh what I should when that white girl came up to me and said, "What should I? What can I do to help?" He was right the first time when he said, "Get the fuck away from me." You want to go do something? See, here's the thing: you got these performative white people, 
and they like to get around niggas and be all Black Lives Matter and woke. You ain't gotta be woke around me. Go be woke at your at your Thanksgiving. Make all them niggas uncomfortable. <laughs> be woke at Christmas. Go to your job and be woke. Uh. You work at Navy Federal. Be woke and approve a bunch of niggas' uh, home uh, applications, home loan applications. Yeah. That's what you can do. The same way that white people at every stage of society attack black Americans, you can fight from wherever you are. You ain't got to come to a fucking meeting. All right. So speaking of that, you know, being able for a white person to do something in that they have agency over, like in their jobs, they, like you said, uh, sign some loans. So I was watching uh, Watermelon Man, a film from the 60s or 70s by... Uh, Melvin Van Peebles, the late Melvin Van Peebles. Um, so his character, or the character of Watermelon Man, is a white man who buys a sun tanning machine, and he sun tans, and I guess he sun tan for too long, and he wakes up a black man. Anyhow, so he he his life changes because now he's a black man, but his. The job that he does is he's an insurance uh, salesman, insurance agent or something like this. And when he becomes black, his uh, boss, you know, uh, sort of relegates him to the black community. He says, we're, we're changing your accounts. Now you're going to service this area with these people. So when he starts doing that, he does something that he doesn't do, that he hasn't done before, which is he starts giving, you know, black families advice on how to uh, benefit from uh, life insurance, and he's not, uh, he isn't particularly selling them on it, but he's educating them, and he's doing he's doing the things that, that are right. But his boss comes to him and tells him, what the hell are you doing? Just sell the policy, and let's keep it moving. But he has a change of heart because he's like, nah, well, I'm doing the right thing because, you know. So to your point, yeah, that's what, you know, some of uh, these, I guess, obnoxious uh, liberals to uh, borrow the phrase from uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's, the name of his uh, his artwork, um, yeah, that's something that they could do. That's something that they have agency over. They could actually um, do something in their positions that could benefit benefit others. And well, let me tell you what else these uh, fucking uh, immigrant blacks do. These well, fucking immigrant blacks. Now, here's the thing: <laughs> when they have a, when it's when it's time to. Uh, uh, award themselves or big up or praise. They're very specific. Jamaican, yeah. Haitian, yeah. Nigerian. Yeah. But when it's something to denigrate, is black this, black that. Oh, I hate these black niggas. Uh. No, you date Nigerian men. Why don't you say, I hate Nigerian men? But you won't say that because there's repercussions behind that. It's easy to take, it's easy to get up. First of all, you was eating fucking mud pies over in Haiti. And now you're going to get on a plane and act brand new around us. Now somehow you better because uh, you won the State Department lottery and they let your stupid ass live over here amongst us. So, all right. So we should reject you off top. All right, let's, all right, speaking of that, um, you know, the, the winning the lottery, being able to come to America and, and having, you know, a different, a different experience. All right, specifically... Let's go to uh, the Jean-Michel Basquiat family. Let's talk about that because here's the, here's the back story on Jean-Michel. In Haiti, his father grew up upper middle class. His, so Jean-Michel Basquiat's uh, grandmother was a businesswoman. And in fact, she was of a lighter complexion than the darkest Haitian. And so in Haiti, they have strong colorist, you know, or they had a strong colorist caste system. The lighter you were, the better off you were. The darker you were, the the worse off you were. Now, it probably wasn't, you know, a caste system, and it really wasn't, hey, this is how it is. It was probably some light-skinned people were, uh, light-skinned Haitians were descendants or, you know, mulattoes mixed or somehow with the French and, and were better off in some ways. But the fact remains that the majority of the um, darker, the darkest Haitians, were not doing as well as some of the lighter fam families. Now, specifically with the Basquiat family, his father had to leave. They had to uh, exile. They had to escape. 
They were Why? refugees. Because in came Papa Doc. Papa Doc Duvalier. Papa Doc was from the lowest. He was a low. He was a lowly, uh, dark-skinned black kid, poor, grew up in a poor family, but he was able to rise to power. Came into power and he shook things up. And one of the things he did was take away homes, businesses, and everything that these established mulattoes, lighter uh, blacks had. And, Probably did the right thing. And what he did then is. Um, I mean, he was he was a, a brutal dictator, you know, because there was uh, there's talk of him, you know, having used uh, voodoo and um, and had a murder squad, basically, and and just. But he was American backed. Right, right. He was American backed. Okay. Now, now listen. Now, now the the Basquiat family, they were well to do. They were doing well, and when they immigrated to America. Gerard Basquiat, the father, his ideal of success was to be, and he wrote this in his uh, in a booklet, in a little notebook. He said, uh, my goal in life is to be a successful, I think, businessman or accountant. He might have written um, to become a, a, because he was already an accountant and um, businessman in Haiti. So it was just a, a skill that he was just transferring over. But that was his ideal. And, you know, he was, he was, he was just that. In America. But his son, you know, didn't follow in his footsteps, but he chose a path of creativity. And his son, his son's artwork is chock full of black reality in America, which may not have been the experience that he had in Haiti. He may not have looked at himself so clearly as a black man, but when he got to America, he saw himself as, you know, as a black man for all of the experiences that he had, like in New York, not getting cabs, being discriminated against, not being allowed because of the way that he looked into certain establishments, being told, you know, this, that, and the third. So for that, for the fact that he, that he experienced that and he wasn't, you know, pushing back, but he was really riding, he was riding for, you know, black culture and for uh, black, um, you know, being noticed you know, then Basquiat is still my dude, still my dude, even though there are obvious uh, others or there are obvious uh, other people who went against, like you said, like you said, went against or go against, you know, uh, Foundational Black Americans or, or ADOS and, and what have you. Uh, my, my thing is that uh, these fucking uh, foreigners, think that uh in general they're better than us they get in all this talk about we don't have a culture when they come here they dick ride our culture dick ride our accomplishments they don't recognize the fact that they wouldn't even be in this country if it wasn't for foundational black americans advocating for them in 64 and 88 so i don't have like my whole thing is if you are a true ally i'm cool but If you're not, let's call it out. Why do we got to pretend like every time you hear these niggas talk, it's black and brown this. Mexicans don't fuck with you. Look at these politicians in L.A. They talk straight care shit about you. And and in the the fundamental level, the prisons ain't nothing more raw of an experience than an American prison. And what do they do? The Mexicans align themselves with the whites. The Asians align themselves with the whites. It is black men against everybody in California prisons. So why we out here pretending like these Mexicans are your allies? They're not your allies in L.A. They're not your allies in Chicago. They're not your allies in Texas. Well, wait a minute, because there was a there was a profound uh, attack on uh, Derek Chauvin in the news by a uh, quote unquote white supremacist who attacked Derek Chauvin, the man, the the police officer who killed uh, George Floyd, and his response was basically black lives matter. You don't, you don't do that. So. He's a white supremacist, but his, his fundam, he was willing to kill over black lives matter. That's not what happened. It was some sort of internal uh, politics amongst the whites. Hmm. They're not, they're not stabbing nobody up in a, uh, a prison over uh, ideologies like that. 
All right, well. I, I don't believe that at all. I believe that's just what he said. That's what the uh, the press ran with. That's the story. Of course. That got, so. Um, so let's, okay. Marcus Garvey. Fuck him. I know, right? <laughs> Marcus. He couldn't get that shit. He couldn't, he couldn't get shit popping with his own people. He come around ours, and uh, we we give him some light, give him some money. He was able to get that shit off, and we running with that Pan African bullshit right. ever since. Uh, them Jamaicans had it right. See, here's the thing: we the only people who are race con. And, and and I understand. Like my my thinking has evolved on this topic. Because I used to be like, Dominicans would go, I'm not black, I'm Dominican. They don't have the same idea of race that we have in America. So, in a way, we are kind of right for folk, folk uh, pushing the issue on them. Because we're not going down to the uh, Dominican Republic and having this conversation. We're having this conversation in America. Okay. But from a Dominican standpoint, or like this new girl, uh, Tyler, she has that song "Water" that's very famous yeah. or whatever. Oh yeah, it's good. And I like to have sex with her. And <laughs> this this girl, she says I can't identify as black because being black in South Africa has wait. a very specific mo- uh, meaning. Wait, wait, that's what she said? Yeah, she can't be black because like uh, to be black is to be like Zulu. Right. She has to. She is She's a colored, colored person. She's colored. Yeah. Her, her parents are Indian and. And mixed race black or whatever. So she she's from a particular class with a particular history. Wait, wait, wait. So our, okay, so uh, South Africa's history and America's histories are similar, but there are those distinctions as far as um, the names that they use that, you know, they, they aren't uh, interchangeable. It, you know, in this case, that this is an example because, you know, we would call ourselves black, but even if we went to, um, South Africa, we be considered colored and not black because of the the distinction that they make there. I don't know. We might be considered black because no, we aren't really mixed race people. No, no, no. Well, I was They're, told. I was told when he when I was told by a South African. Oh, okay. He said, "You know what? When you come to South Africa, they're gonna look at you and call you colored, like that's your status." And I was like, "Huh?" But maybe so, and maybe it's because uh, we're also. Uh, outsiders like yeah like the politics of uh, South Africa are different that's the thing like as black people we gotta realize and that's why I'm saying we shouldn't automatically be looking at anybody in the diaspora as some sort of brother or sister because they don't have that uh, ideology Nigerians don't think of themselves black until they get here they think of themselves as Igbo and Yoruba and uh, whatever that other one they got Edo, over there Ed, I think Edo Igbo. or, or, or the Mandingos and all that shit. Yeah. They're tribal. They think of themselves based on whatever tribe they come from, as they should. Because uh, our ideology comes from the fact that we don't have a, uh, a tribe in that way. We're, we're united around a shared history yep. of uh, American chattel slavery based on skin color. All right, we're going to cut it right there. You're listening to the IC10.9 podcast. This is Mike and Larry, and we're doing our thing. You're at 109 right now. Oh, I got that girl's name. I can, I can shit on her when I come back. <laughs> <laughs>